Greetings and salutations friends and welcome back to yet more Warhammer lore. Today we're going to go back to some of the nightly orders because it's been a while and uh, we still have a few left to cover. We'll start with the Knights and Carmine. This bunch of uh, rather fascinating and remarkably asshole individuals are an interesting little organisation. Now most nightly orders are of course made up of Knights, therefore nobles, but the Knights in Carmine take this philosophy to its logical extreme. To be a member of the Knights in Carmine, you have to be particularly douchey to your underlings. It requires great amounts of wealth, power, and also great amounts of disdain for the lower classes. In fact, the reason why they don't use shields in battle is not because they've decided that using two swords is more effective for the killing or some such nonsense, it's simply because they consider a shield to be a low-class defence. It's uh, quite commonplace for those filthy, dirty, commoner scum to simply hide behind a metal barrier in combat. Truly dis. Disgusting cowardice, if you ask me, but hey, it's way better to simply just ride into battle encased in solid plate armour, because that is considerably braver. Because of reasons. Anyways, the order was founded by a rich dilettante by the name of Frederico Toscano of Tilea. Essentially, he founded this organisation because he had to serve his military duty somewhere and figured it would be a hell of a lot easier to serve said military duty if he decided where he was going to serve said military duty. It is this choice that is one of the primary, uh, shall we say, incentives to join this particular band, seeing as their members are all rich and most of them politically powerful, the Knightly Order has a lot of pull when it comes to when and where they will be sent into battle. This, combined with the fact that they genuinely don't actually want to fight all that much, means that they will usually pick campaigns where they can gain a decent amount of glory in return for virtually no work. Personally, I naturally applaud this highly other-sacrificial idea. They will allow the lesser men of the Empire and the other knightly orders to take the glory of battle. The Knights in Carmine will satisfy themselves with the laurels of mere victory. They will take upon themselves the heavy burden of sweeping in at the last moment to claim victory. It's a dirty job and a dishonourable one, but someone's got to do it and the Knights in Carmine are just the men you would want for the task. To further reinforce their noble nature, they utilise a fairly unique Tilean fighting style using two swords, where one weapon is used primarily in a defensive capacity while the other one strikes the finishing blow. They are of course also required to paint their suits of plate mail in a fabulous Encarmine tone. Unfortunately, however, this fabulous coat of paint is not entirely ideal for the battlefield and tends to chip off rather easily, which means that after every single engagement, the Knights in Carmine will have to spend a fair bit of time repainting their armour. Conveniently, this very, very important knightly tradition also prevents them, unfortunately, from taking part in the dirty and exhausting chase after an enemy. You know, the part of the battle where you have to chase down the enemy army, making sure that they can't reoccupy better positions and you can't give them any rest, which means you're gonna have to do a forced march, possibly for days at a time. Unfortunately, even though the Knights in Carmine would happily help with such a laborious endeavour, they're busy with important traditions, so... Yeah, shoulda, coulda, woulda, but unfortunately, just isn't possible. All of these slight attitude problems notwithstanding, however, the Knights in Carmine are still a unit of heavy shock cavalry, and they do know how to use those swords, so generally speaking, despite their occasionally somewhat rotten attitude, they are usually welcomed on the battlefield. Although, to be fair, the people they are sent to reinforce will very rarely have anything to say in the matter, so there is that. And from one opportunistic order to another, the Order of the Black Rose. This bunch is a rather interesting little group, because usually the 
former example notwithstanding, knightly orders are either a fairly pious bunch in the case of the Templar orders, or a fairly noble militaristic nobility, a knighthood of the most exquisite pedigree in the case of the more traditional ones. The Order of the Black Rose is quite the oddity, because it's more along the lines of a heavily politicised mercenary band. They were originally founded as the bodyguards of the would-be Emperor of Stirlin during the time of the Three Emperors. Now, after that, they decided that they wanted to be on the winning side, and famously changed their allegiance no less than three times during the course of the wars. And even today, their loyalty is, um, not entirely set in stone. The Order's Grand Master tends to utilise them in whatever way will serve him, and through him, the Order, best. The Heavy Cavalry is, at the moment, a bodyguard of Attila of Talibuckland, not Stirland, as you will have probably noticed, and despite their somewhat checkered history, they are damn good knights. You see, being appointed to the Order of the Black Rose is considered a great show of faith by the state, by the local province, essentially, because, very unusually, anyone that is appointed to the Order of the Black Rose is outfitted at the province's expense. This is an extreme rarity. In practically every single knightly order, every member is expected to pay for his own gear. He is expected to provide his own food, he is expected to provide his own arms, armour, and obviously horses. Which means that the Order of the Black Rose is very, very unique indeed, but there is reason for this. Considering that the Order is essentially a group of highly political mercenaries that will fight for the highest bidder, it is, as you can probably imagine, very much so within the Order's Grand Master's interest to make sure that they are loyal to him first and foremost, which is why he's the one that essentially gets them their equipment. Technically, they are paid for by the state, for example, in this case, by Talibuckland, but the Grand Master is the man who gets them these deals, who gets them this equipment, you know? It's a good way of buying the loyalty of a band who have no real loyalties, elevating what might, for example, be a mere footman to the rank of knight with all of the prestige uh, and, of course, monetary benefits that follows with such a title, that buys a lot of loyalty. And their loyalty is most definitively valuable, as I mentioned before, they are pretty damn good fighters, and being mercenaries, they do have a certain tendency to get themselves involved into all kinds of uncomfortable conflicts. They usually carry heavy lances, backed up by maces, occasionally swords, and kite shields, all of which is of course emblazoned with the rose and thorns of their order. Their armour is entirely pitch black, except for their gauntlets, which is painted red to symbolise the blood of their foes, all very poetic. They're also unusually fond of skulls, decorating their armour and their horse's armour with various skull insignia, signifying a connection, or perhaps just something as simple as an affiliation, with the god Mor. Now, of course, this might simply just be good old-fashioned uh, superstition, thinking that, well, we are mercenaries, therefore we might die any day, because, you know, getting thrown into silly little battles here and there for money, and therefore it could be a pretty damn good idea to keep in Moore's good book, to make sure that you're not going to be doomed to wander the lands of eternal damnation and death and such other nonsense for all eternity, or, you know, just getting thrown into the realms of chaos, where your soul is going to be devoured by nasty-toothed demon monsters. So, yeah, in a universe where that is an option, staying cosy with the god of death is not a bad idea whatsoever. And lastly, of course, it simply makes them look awesome. That whole shock and awe thing should never be underestimated. After all, if you can scare your enemy into running away before he gets to hit you with a heavy, blunt object, your odds of surviving the battle have just increased dramatically. And with that, I will be wrapping up this uncharacteristically short video. 
I know, I know, it's, uh, it is a very short video by my standards, but, uh, well, I've had a bit of a Let's Play vacation this week, so I've just been a bit lazy. There will be a bigger one next week, and uh, it's going to be a fairly interesting one, so do look forward to that. Until then, I have been Arch, thank you very much for watching, and I do hope to see you all again soon. Have a good day.